evening, everybody. You are watching After the Show with Jen Baldwin. I'm the host of Jen Chat, and we are here tonight to discuss the second episode of Who Do You Think You Are with Christina Applegate, which I'm pretty sure just made everybody cry. Mm -hmm. We have some very special guests this evening, so if you'd like to start by introducing yourself, we'll start with you, Pat. Uh, I'm Dear Myrtle, your friend in genealogy. Michael? I'm Michael Haight. Pat's friend in genealogy. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, Gina. I'm Gina Philibert Ortega, and I'm a researcher from Southern California. Fantastic. Thank you, all of you, for joining us this evening. Really appreciate your time tonight. Um, we're discussing the episode, of course, but we also want to make sure that you, our audience, can be included. So if you have any comments or suggestions as we go through this conversation, please send me a tweet or um, put a message out on our Google Plus page or the YouTube channel, pretty much any network. We'll try to get, get to it as best that we can. We're going to start tonight the same way we did last week, the emotional response of Christina Applegate. I think it was pretty intense this evening. No one can doubt that. And I'm just wondering what your overview is, your thoughts on the episode in general, the episode as a whole. Pat, go ahead. So not Hollywood. <laughs> it was real and it was intense. And I know Gina hasn't seen it yet because it hasn't aired yet That's right. <laughs> in the Pacific time zone. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Gina's here tonight to uh, help us out with our women's research angle. Um, definitely that's her specialty area, so we wanted her to be on this episode specifically. Michael, what did you think of the episode? Um, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was very, um, it, it's very difficult, I, I can imagine, uh, for Christina to, to find out quite such a dark past when they really didn't know anything at all to start with and you know they probably went in expecting they were going to find you know something maybe a little bit less bad <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I thought it was interesting. She actually tweeted yesterday, um, and this is a quote, it's odd to ask people to watch something so private and personal, but I've been asked to tweet about who do you think you are tomorrow on TLC. So I think even just from her perspective, it was definitely a difficult journey. Has Have any of you experienced anything like that in your own research? Go ahead, Pat. Well, I haven't had anything that violent. Um, but I have had a situation in a Civil War um, ancestor's pension file where his widow did not receive widow's benefits because while uh, William G. Froman was in Leavenworth, not the prison, but the old soldier's home there, mm -hmm. um, she lived with a series of se several men. That's the uh, wife. And so not only did she not receive the um, widow's pension, but only the older eligible children, not the two youngest ones, received child benefits when the old soldier passed away because the uh, question of eternity came up. And, and that was a little startling for me, copying the original records with my 13 and 14 year old daughters with me in the National Archives textual reading room. Um, and the reaction of my 14-year-old daughter, and, and you're not really reading this in detail as you're photocopying big, thick files, but she said, Mom, I'm glad we descended through the first child. <laughs> <laughs> so that was our experience with a pretty uncomfortable situation. Nothing compared to what um, this episode uh, represented, but it was close. Yeah. Michael, go ahead. Uh, well, uh, you know, it's not quite the same with uh, because it wasn't really a path of discovery. Um, it was a story we pretty much all already knew. Um, my uh, mother's father uh, basically abandoned the family hmm. and uh, just you know left and and started started living with another woman and um, while he was still married while my mother was an infant and um, you know it. it it was, um, you know, like I said, we already knew the story, but uh, g this actually, just this year, just a couple of months ago, I was able to track down the actual divorce file oh. and, um, you know, see all of the the details of it. And um, 
uh, you know, there wasn't any alcoholism involved to my knowledge, but it was, um, you know, it was, it was hard. And, and, uh, you know, I, I know that someone on gen chat said something about, um, you know, make, makes me want to call my grandmother or something. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm lucky. I just, uh, my grandparents, my, my grandmother, uh, remarried to, uh, my grandfather, my, who I consider my grandfather. Mm. Um, and, you know, he raised my mother and, and has been grandfathered us. And, um, you know, I just was able to see them a few weeks ago. They, they live in Indiana now, um, after having left Maryland and, um, you know, it, it was, it was great. I, you know, I, I actually, I lived with them for, for a few years and, you know, I've just always been very close to my grandparents. So, you know, actually seeing the divorce record was, was different. It was, it, it was a different experience. Um, even though we already knew the story, you know, and I shared it with my mother as well. Uh, and she was, you know, I think she was moved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In tears to actually see it on paper. Yeah. Well, she was in Colorado at the time. You know, she lives in Colorado. So um, I I don't, I don't know. I I know she was moved because of her response. It was Mm -hmm. just kind of like an emailed, wow, (laughs) you know. Yeah. Yeah. Gina, what about you? Any experiences that you can share with us? I've definitely had some experiences and, you know, some um, are, involve people who are still alive and they've asked me to keep that private obviously but I think for me when I'm researching people's lives I expect there to be some of this Um, and I think people are people and that's what tells the story and so I guess I kind of not only expect it but I'm always kind of cautious when I don't find things like this Um, and I really I find it interesting, I'm sure uh, Michael and uh, Mert do too, that, you know, people who want their family to all be angelic, Mm. to me it's the the people whose lives were messy, they're the ones who leave a good paper trail. (laughs) Amen to that. (laughs) Exactly. And and gosh, I mean, life is messy. It isn't perfect. And it always, uh, I always find it funny that people think that just because they were a few generations ago or early late 1800s that their lives were perfect and they were angelic so I don't know I don't know if anybody's angelic especially not my family <laughs> well and definitely not in mine either not in mine either we, yeah. we could have a whole hangout with me yeah. just telling stories yeah. to my family trust me right. <laughs> more recent generations older generations you know yeah. <laughs> I have a long history of black sheep we're just all sheep <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's exactly. interesting. I think my closest um, comparison is my great grandfather, actually, who, similar to Michael's story, actually, that he married once and they had a child and then disappeared on the train and actually headed west to Washington State. And we don't actually technically know if they ever got divorced or not, but he did marry again and had the family that I then came from. And we didn't know about any of this until probably 18 months ago, two years ago, when I found it in a newspaper record. Um, and have since contacted the descendants family of the other woman and it's something that we don't talk about with each other at all Mm -hmm. we don't actually talk to each other because they just um, they have so much animosity still towards him and what happened and then other descendants actions as well that there's just so much um, angst there that they just don't address it whatsoever Wow. you know um, Jen I think that um, letting go of the fear and the anger and the unknown and all that is something that happened to Christina's father and what she was which was the gift she gave him at the end Mm -hmm. because now he knew um, that his mother loved him and cared for him she was not able to care for him in the traditional sense but you recall the words when Christina said you broke the mold and you right. created this different way of living for us and that is awesome dad that is awesome oh man I've, okay I'm muting myself while I snivel and sneeze and it's my allergies guys 
Of course it is, yes. <laughs> it was quite an episode, wasn't it? Um, just, um, yeah. Before we move on, I, just a, as a uh, aside, kind of from what um, Pat was saying, um, la my blood grandfather actually had other children at the same time he was having children, you know, my mother and um, her siblings with my grandmother. And um, last year at Thanksgiving, my oldest aunt, my mother's oldest sister, um, was hosting Thanksgiving dinner and actually invited one of those children, one of her, their half siblings, to Thanksgiving dinner. And um, yeah, I see your face. That was, it was, my, my mother was not there, thank goodness, because my mother doesn't know how to keep her mouth shut. I, I get that from her. But um, my other... <laughs> My, I didn't say anything, her, Michael, not a word. Her, her youngest sister was there, and and it, it really runs in the family, not being able to keep your mouth shut, but it was stunning that even dur in the midst of watching a, a, a Redskins-Cowboys game, my aunt was did not speak mm. the entire dinner. Wow. And um, it was very, you know... Awkward for her, I can imagine, uh, because this this half sister of hers is a uh, few years older than she is, mm. and um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pat, go ahead, please. Well, that makes me wonder. Like with with Gina's experience, we, all of us have some of this in our family. In my immediate family, my own mother really doesn't have anything to do with those of us. Um, by her first marriage and only concentrates on the younger three by the second marriage though behind her back all of us kids get along fine but as genealogists what do we what do we document Gina what do we do Michael Jen what you know do we keep the secret do we keep uh, what do we do you know, I think it's difficult. I mean, my personal feeling is that if people are alive that are going to be hurt by that, then you don't broadcast it. I mean, you could put it in a file and keep it for later or, or something like that, but um, I don't want to be known as the family tattletale, you know, because people have entrusted me with some secrets, and I figure in due time it'll be time to talk about that. But, I mean, I think that's a good question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Taking it from another um, perspective, um, or from another angle, you know, we actually had a, a conversation about, I was having a conversation about this uh, with someone, yes, well, Monday was yesterday, right? Yeah, right. yesterday. I think so. And, <laughs> and um, you know, when we're, when we're researching our, our genealogies, you know, it's one thing, you know, for, for professionals, you know, you do what they want and and mm -hmm. you know from from that perspective um, you don't really have a choice but when you're researching your own family you you definitely have a choice as far as what you want to research and what you want to document and and mm -hmm. not just in the sense of um, you know what facts you should share and what facts you shouldn't but even what lines I've spent just as much time researching my step grandfather as I have my real grandfather's mm -hmm. history and and that's just a personal decision, um, you to know. To honor him. Yeah, well, because in, in and you know, the the way that I expressed it to my grandparents when when you know I talked to them about it, is I said you know, the, you know, a lot of genealogists just focus on the bloodline. Well, blood comes out of your heart, and and he's mm -hmm. the grandfather in my heart. Yeah, and, I love you that. Know. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Um, you know, that's, how, that's how I feel about my stepmother. Yeah, it's definitely a difficult topic, isn't it? Um, there's no doubt about that. And in fact, there's some interesting conversation that occurs on Facebook in the, what's it called? I think it's the Black Sheep for Genealogy Facebook mm -hmm. group that addresses some of these issues. And how do you handle it and how do you address it? And certainly for most people, I think it's not a question of doing professional research. You know, obviously the vast majority of genealogists are amateurs or hobbyists. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a difficult thing to tackle. Well, and you don't want to hurt people 
because I think telling our family stories isn't about hurting other people that are still alive. And so I think that's really important to consider. Yeah, I agree, Gina. Definitely. Um, I actually did have a, a client project last year where something uh, very similar occurred. Um, and I won't obviously divulge any names or any specifics. Um, and, and I, you know, told my client this because, you know, I, I do do a lot of writing and teaching and, and you know, he knows that. And, um, you know, I told him out of discretion that I would never, um, you know, discuss any of the details. But I, I can talk in vague terms um, that, you know, basically in, in conducting the research, he didn't know anything about his grandmother's parents. And, and um, uh, basically there was a case of adultery where uh, one party killed the other, killed mm -hmm. their spouse. Mm -hmm. And the secret had basically, you know, died with the last member of that generation. And, no, and he never knew, his mother never knew, you know, nobody ever knew the secret. They knew there was something. They knew that, mm -hmm. and, um, but they didn't know the truth. You know, they didn't know what had happened. Wow. And, uh, you know, it's, you have to be, you know, especially, you know, whether it's your family or, or someone else's family, you do. You have to be very sensitive about those kinds of issues because that does, even if you, even if it's people you never knew, you know, it, it still can hurt. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Very powerful. Thank you all so much for contributing all of that. It was an amazing conversation. Let's change the tone a little bit, though, because um, who do you think you are is supposed to be a fun thing to do. <laughs> um, and I would really, I've never pursued divorce records as heavily as they discussed it here. So I'm just kind of interested if, um, I know Michael had mentioned some divorce records earlier, and Gina, I'm sure you may have some stories to share as well. Tell us about your experiences researching divorce. Well, you know, one of my favorites is, if you can say a divorce story is a favorite, <laughs> is um, I had a fourth grade grandmother who I knew had remarried, and um, it was assumed that her first husband had died in the Civil War. But it was just an assumption. And so one day when we were researching on site, I said, you know what, I'm going to go look in the... Uh, cases and see if there was a divorce and my cousin was just flabbergasted and I should say this is in 1850 and um, she just thought I had you know fallen off the wagon or something she just thought <laughs> what is your problem and um, sure You're enough competent they had genealogist well, that's what I see and I expect <laughs> that people's lives are messy and that you know my personal opinion is, is people have always hated their spouses and got divorces. It doesn't matter what time period. So, um, and sure enough, they had divorced. And um, unfortunately, the records of the whole case weren't there, but the final, uh, you know, it, the it, final papers were. And it basically said that the boys went with the husband and the girls went with uh, the wife and uh, provided some information. Now what's cool is, and this is kind of a larger tip, remember that the whole court file wasn't there for whatever reason. It was actually, the case files were in uh, cabinets in a closet at the courthouse. So it's not a real great filing system anyway. And uh, kind of like mine. Sounds what are you familiar, about? Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like at my house. So, um, Many years later, I was Googling this ancestress's name in Google Books and found a hit for her in a book that a professor wrote as part of his uh, dissertation about the region in Texas she was from. And in there, he had a chapter about women who had divorced in 1850 in this region. And she was one of the cases. Now, when he had gone to the courthouse, they were able to find more of the paperwork, and he actually knew what the cause of the divorce was, which I had not, and it ended up that it was abuse. Wow. So it just kind of shows you that sometimes we think, okay, well, here's the divorce records, and that's it. But sometimes you really need to do a little more complete research, and whether that's digitized books or the newspaper or whatever, you need all of that to tell a story. Mm. So. Yeah. Yeah. In in my experience, um, 
the divorce records have not been as as interesting as the newspapers and mm-hmm. and um, you know I, I love see- well I shouldn't say I love seeing it because unless unless I uh, am going to admit that I'm a glutton for naughtiness but I, <laughs> I love I love seeing in the newspaper the the advertisements where the husband says you know I'm not paying any of her debts uh, yeah <laughs> you know those those kinds of messages and um. You know, in in but in my research, I I seem to find more um, people just leaving. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, and and the divorce may or may not ever actually happen. You know, Absolutely. In, in, in some cases, um, you know, a few few divorce cases that I've looked at, you know, you know, a divorce may be filed ten years after they've never even lived together. You know, they finally decide to file for divorce. Um, yeah. Do you think it's a matter of big migration patterns? You know, like going to Washington State, that's the far end of the of the Oregon Trail up to the donation land areas there. Do you think it's part of that, that there just wasn't any, it wasn't even a state yet? There was no court? You know, I don't know about Michael, but my experience has been that I've found tons of people who were bigamous. Mm-hmm. And they just didn't get a divorce mm-hmm. because you could easily move to even the next county and nobody would ever find you. It's not like today mm-hmm. where we're so accessible to people. And so I think it could be for a lot of reasons. It could be expense. It could be that you just take off because you don't want to be financially responsible for that family anymore. I mean, I think it could be a lot of things. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'll just do a plug for Ron Aaron's book, The Jews of Sing Sing. He found um, bigamy in his family, and that book is about that. And it, it, I, I loved reading it because I have found so many cases with clients and, and others where the, you know, someone just takes off one day, and that's the end of it. Mm-hmm. And there is no official divorce. What well, was the official uh, representative of the East Coast here? I'll say that that was never a problem in most of my research. Uh, as far as you know, the states where I do a lot of my research have been around since the 17th century with courts. Oh, mm-hmm. So um, you know, <laughs> um, I, I'll tell you what I find interesting though is is um, y- y- when you when you see things that happen after one spouse dies. Um, you know, of natural causes, you know, give or take. But you know, I've got I've got two cases in my family where, at, when the, the wife died and the husband married another woman, much younger, mm-hmm. almost immediately. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have a couple of cases like that in my family, <laughs> including one where he was in his seventies and she was in her twenties. Um, but they were in Tennessee, so it's cool. Um, <laughs> Oh, that explains it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? You see that too. I mean, obviously today, but even like after the Civil War, I mean, it makes sense that you would marry a pensioner because you've got some guaranteed income there. Well, that's one of my cases. Was yeah. a uh, was a un- well, he. I, if you've seen the Civil War lecture that I give, I talk about my ancestor who served in both Union and Confederate armies. Well, after his wife died, he actually ended up he, – he, he got a union pension, and his second wife, who was in her 30s, got a uh, widow's pension. But what I found most interesting was after they got married, uh, they appear in the Chancery uh, Court of, of Rockingham County. And, and anybody who does research in Virginia had better be looking at those Chancery Court records, especially since the Library of Virginia – has has been indexing them and putting them online, and I waited for four years for them to finish Rockingham County so that I could get this two hundred some odd page case. Whoa! Where wow. his two adult sons, including my, you know, my ancestor, mm-hmm. um, were suing him because they didn't want his um, his new wife to get the land that he had by right of their mother mm. and uh, squandering away his, you know, the, the land and the money that they were due to inherit from, you know, from their father, you know, by right of their mother. Um, 
and oh, they la- they they aired all the dirty laundry in this case. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> You can tell, I mean, they were taught, I mean, the father was talking bad about one of the sons, not my ancestor, of course, he was a saint. He was a saint. <laughs> Naturally. But, you and Mr. Mert. That's right, that's right. <laughs> like I said, all of my sheep are black, so, <laughs> um, you know, it, it's it's just really fascinating, and, and you know, what's what's interesting, and you know, since, to get back to the divorce question, is that um, Chancery, the Chancery Court is in charge of equity cases, and that's what most divorce cases are heard by the equity courts. They're considered equity records. So, so you're really talking about the same records, even though, um, you know, 150 years ago when divorce was a little less common, they tended to deal more with other things like, you know, my my people suing each other and that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> And you know, for me, the one the one instance of um, documentation that I have in this kind of topic in my personal family line is um, a couple that actually ended up separating because she was tired of having babies, and so she kicked him out and made him go live in another house two counties away. And then after she was too old, she invited him back in. So they never got divorced; they just separated for twenty years or so, and then got back together and lived out the rest of their life. Well, see, you get, you you know, the heart grows fonder, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Don't give my wife any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the other thing is, you end up going to the same baby blessings and, uh, you know, different events, the same wedding, so you you end up, I mean, what is a divorce unless you do live a continent apart? you still are part of the children's lives in many cases. In other cases, not at all. Yeah, one would hope at least. Yeah. My parents are almost a continent apart and and it's not enough. <laughs> <laughs> we laugh, but it's a sad thing. It really it is. is. My my parents were like that till my dad passed away. As a matter of fact, <laughs> when my when I cared for my dad during the last uh, months and years of his life, um, we were starting to go through things in the house and he said, oh, go in that cupboard. There's a black case and it's your grandfather Froman's clarinet. Now that's my mother's father. And I said, dad, how did you ever get this innocently? And my dad just didn't say a word. And I can realize that was probably something they fought over. And my mother is remarried, has those three kids by the other husband, and yet he still kept, my dad still kept that clarinet. I'm glad he told me because if I had gone through the household of things later with my brother as we did, I would have wondered about that clarinet. Right. So we're lucky tonight to have someone on the uh, on the panel who actually worked a little bit on the show. Yay! Good for Yay. you, Michael. <laughs> uh, so we're really excited that Michael was able to join us tonight. So we're going to segue into maybe talking about a little bit of the behind the scenes stuff, if that's um, reasonable for you, Michael. But I do want to uh, point out we've gotten a couple comments from Twitter, and one of them includes "Never thought about digging into divorce records until now." from Mm -hmm. Kelly Kirby Fisher. So um, I think this show has definitely intrigued a lot of people in different avenues of research. So that's exciting to see. So Michael, we're going to put you on the spot once again. Can you share a little bit with us about working on the show? Uh, I don't know how much I'm allowed to tell about um, behind the scenes per se. yeah, don't you break know, any contracts. We, yeah, yeah we, <laughs> we, there is non-disclosure agreement, confidentiality agreements, and all of that. Um, and I was, I, I read them very carefully before. <laughs> <laughs> I think I am allowed to talk a little bit about some of the research that I did, though. Um, as long as you know, since the episode has aired, and and this research, these stories are not, um, were not part of the episode. I think I can do this, and and if not. I'm sorry, please don't sue me. (laughs) Um, uh, The research that I did was actually on Ovid Shaw, who was Lavina's father. And uh, it it was very interesting. He was from Maryland, Southern Maryland. And and 
especially given the the emphasis on alcoholism in um, in in tonight's episode, um, which had a very different theme from Kelly Clarkson saying, "Oh man, he was part of the temperance movement." <laughs> um, you know the the there there may have been a history of alcoholism in her family. Now I don't know that. I wasn't able to find anything related to Ovid in alcoholism, um, but he did spend some time in the uh, Maryland State Penitentiary hmm. for killing his brother, his younger brother Alfonso. Um, Alfonso had left the uh, left, you know, left Charles County where they're from, which was at the time a, a dry county. Uh, it had been a dry county for maybe a year or two prior to uh, this event. And he had gone north to Prince George's County where I grew up and liquor was always flowing um, to, uh, ironically enough, a town called Brandywine. And um, and he had, I, I'm not sure if he was drinking brandy or wine, but however, whatever he was drinking, he, he came back home and started a fight. And uh, the end of the fight, was him dead and, and Ovid or Ovid uh, going to prison. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, you know, I kind of wonder if, if Levina's problems uh, with alcohol may have come from that side of the family. Uh, I think we all know that, that alcoholism is a genetic trait. Um, and, you know, so, so I, I, it kind of made me wonder as I was watching this episode if if there there could have been some kind of a, a genetic connection there. Michael, can I ask you what kind of record groups you looked at in your research? Um, I actually found the most detail in news in a newspaper. Um, I also had uh, the death certificate for Alfonso um, and. I, I did go through court records and penitentiary records. Uh, the court records during this time period, court records um, outside of the Chancery Court, just the normal circuit court, were not particularly informative. You know, they talked about the charges. Mm -hmm. um, they talked about the outcome. They would name the jurors. Um, you know, that sort of thing. But no, it didn't. It didn't no have testimony. No. Yeah. No, you, you'd really, uh, at least in Maryland, you really don't find that at, at all during this period in the court records. Um, you tend to find that more in the newspapers. Uh, in in another case, um, you know, I, I was able to find, you know, article after article that were had verbatim transcripts of the trial, and the court records themselves were completely silent. Mm -hmm. um, but the um, you know, like the prison records, the the penitentiary records. Uh, one of the things I looked at was the intake, um, where he, you know, it actually gave physical description of him. Uh, it did not have a photograph attached, unfortunately. I know um, Colorado has has photos online yeah, of some sure of their do. penitentiary records. Mm -hmm. uh, this didn't have any photos in it. It was just basically, you know, they checked in every prisoner and gave a physical description of of the person, the height, weight, you know, eye color, hair color, you know, sort of thing we see on, uh, you know, a lot of different records, military records in particular. Mm. Um, but he, then he ended up actually uh, being paroled after he, he was not convicted of murder, which is what he was originally charged with. He was convicted of manslaughter mm. and uh, was sentenced to, I th believe if I'm remembering correctly he was sentenced to about three years only served about uh, a year and a half I think and was paroled and uh, I actually had the parole uh, certificate that it was signed by the governor uh, I was able to locate that so you know you can find some detail in the court records but but really you know just like I said earlier the the newspaper records is where you get the the real meat and potatoes of the of the cases during this time period mm -hmm. I think it matters where you're researching to. Yeah, it Obviously, does. Yeah. It does. But, you know, the, the thing about the newspapers, too, is sometimes they'll say what court cases are going on, and they'll just have a list, and they'll talk about the divorces and, and uh, what the charges are and stuff. So there yeah. can be wonderful things. 
Yeah, and that's a really nice segue, Gina. Um, thanks. Um, I will just add quickly in the state of Colorado, since um, Michael brought it up, you can access almost all of the penitentiary records on the online um, database. Uh, you can at least see the index, and then if you go to the Colorado State Archives, they have a photograph for almost every inmate, which I have done, and it's quite interesting. Yeah. Um, nice. And you can also yeah. see the link in my... Um my book, Online State Resources. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, let me, let me throw in a plug there. <laughs> yeah. so, so for all those on tweet chat, that's a drink for the plug. <laughs> <laughs> then I'll go ahead and plug my Colorado Legacy Quick Guide, which has the link as well. Um, <laughs> so Gina, I'm going to go back to you for a second mm -hmm. because I know that you tweeted a little bit during the show as well and you were talking uh, to people specifically about abuse records. Someone specifically asked on Twitter, which I thought was interesting, about how common it was for abuse cases to be documented during this time period. And you definitely indicated newspapers during that process yeah. but and police blotters, but it, if you have yeah. any further comment, can you expand on that a little bit? You know, the, the problem is, is with domestic violence, that wasn't always considered a crime. And so, uh, you know, there might be a court case, and it might show up in a divorce case. I've seen lots of things in the newspaper where the divorce or some action is listed, and it talks about being abused. But for that time period, it would probably be very rare to find something uh, officially in some kind of government documentation. You know, even earlier than that, women who are being abused by their husbands could even be... Um, sent to an insane asylum mm -hmm. and um, there's even less records about that so um, so that would be hard to to find but you know the newspaper is where I would go first and then I would also check court records and see if there was any kind of charges brought uh, against the person but my guess is no yeah anybody else have anything to add on abuse style records I, th I, I th go ahead, Michael. Oh no, I was just going to say I haven't actually come across any any um, records that that really document abuse other than you know like a court docket where someone it shows that someone was charged with it. Right. Um, you know, of course, whether they were found guilty or not is is yeah, um, yeah. you know something completely different. Yeah. I can remember hearing in a presentation that Sharon D. Bartolo Carmack gave, and uh, also was reiterated in her book *Finding Female Ancestors*, mm -hmm. um, that putting women, as you mentioned, Gina, in an asylum was a good way of getting rid of that first wife, yeah. or women that became problematic, so to speak, because the gentleman in question didn't want to appear uh, as unreliable or whatever. It, he had his standing in the community to maintain. Mm -hmm. And so women frequently in that time period, Sharon said, took laudanum, which, uh, you know, they self-medicated. It was very common for that to happen. There were some overdoses inadvertent or maybe advertent, I don't know. But that women were put away like that. Uh, women did, it's hard to remember because in our lifetime, even old gray-haired old Mert, we've had the vote mm -hmm. and we've had more standing than was provided for our female ancestors in generations before. Oh, right. definitely. And and you have to remember, too, I mean, I mentioned, I think, on one of the tweets, I used to work in the domestic violence field. And it really is very recently where people have taken it more seriously and, and there's been laws and, and that kind of thing. And, and those sometimes don't even end up like we would think. So really, you are talking about newspapers, if anything. And, you know, if there's a journal or a diary, but there's going to be very little... Uh, to document that story. Yeah, I um, actually have been working a lot on the fraternal societies in my local community, yeah. and which some of you are aware of. And mm -hmm. um, um, 
I have found that there's a great deal of political intrigue um, and so I have actually located some records in the county courthouse where they sent women to a sane asylums. Um, there's no real reason specified but it's the mm -hmm. same four signatures on every document over the course of about 10 years. They're all the members of the same fraternal society, they're all buddies, so you know, who they knows what was really other. going on, but... Um, well, and at a time where women had no power at all, I mean, they didn't have the vote, they, they, you know, they just had very little, and there's there's not a lot they can do to leave. I mean, it, it becomes obvious that, you know, you either take it and you shut up, or your husband goes and puts you in the insane asylum. And I know, you know... Takes uh, care of you. Yeah, Jen, I was doing research on something else, but was talking to someone at a state facility who worked in medical records and she said you know what just file after file after file of women in the early 1900s late 1800s are there because their husbands committed them and they needed no reason for that wow so well and and we should be fair uh, women are not the only victims of abuse in a marital relationship sure. Sure. and so Michael um, I, I don't mean to be prejudicing this part of the comments. You know, I will <laughs> say if you're interested I'm in that out of it. <laughs> if you're interested in that topic, there's a great book by Linda Gordon, and it's all about um, the societies that helped women in the early 1900s and children who were being abused. And um, so it is a, a bigger historical research, and there is a lot of information about that. So. That's great. If you um, get a chance, Gina, we'd love to see you post that on your social media accounts so we can all access that. I will definitely do that. Fantastic. We've got about five minutes left. I have one more comment from Twitter I want to share for sure. And the quote is, I'm a little disappointed that Dear Myrtle isn't wearing her top hat in this video. <laughs> <laughs> I, actually, I actually do have it. Um, and... It came from Florida and his was packed and stayed packed for five years at my house in Eagle Mountain. Now mm -hmm. that Mr. Mert and I have moved here together, I, I actually was thinking I should wear that sometime. Got and it. now Michael has... <laughs> oh, there we go. Got Michael's it. got it. Good. Very nice. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I do have a picture on file. It's my ammunition of some colleagues and I all in pirate hats on one ah. of these. So... Um, <laughs> I'll pull but, it out when the time is right. <laughs> what I should have done was been smart like footnote maven and just started with the TR right off the bat. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, so, I just like I said, about five minutes left. I want to give you the opportunity to have any closing comments. I think this has been a fascinating conversation, and I really want to thank each of you for participating tonight. It's uh, really been an incredible evening. So, we'll just go down the row if you have any last um, last comments to share about the episode or anything we've discussed. Who wants to start? Gina? Okay, I'll start. <laughs> we'll start this way and then go down. There you yeah. go. Gina, so, you need to start by watching the show. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, I was really happy to see that there was newspapers. I mean, obviously, I watched some of the previews, and um, Megan tweeted a few times that Genealogy Bank was, it was obvious they were using that. You know, we are so lucky now as researchers to have access to digitized newspapers, and you can find articles about stuff that, you know, if you were just doing the microfilm and, and looking, you know, page by page, you wouldn't be able to find as easy. And so I really encourage people to go and start researching those newspapers and think beyond the vital record stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much more out there than that. Yeah, definitely. And cool. I want to congratulate you on a six, very successful tour with Jean oh, um, thank this you. past month. Congratulations right. to Yay. you both on that. Thank you. <laughs> Michael, you're up. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to uh, just uh, concur. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> That's no, it. I, I, think, I, I agree, though. That, I mean, newspapers really do uh, provide quite a bit. And, and just to add um, something that uh, Gina didn't, didn't mention is, is you may not be aware. I mean, you know, not all newspapers are available online. And you may not be aware of what newspapers were being published. Um, but the Library of Congress has a, a uh, directory of newspapers on the Chronicling America Definitely. site, and I mm -hmm. use that for most most research projects. You know, you can you can you know 
search for a specific location in a specific uh, time or a specific date. And uh, that, you know, it gives you, it really tells you where to, where to look. Um, the, the records that, that I found, the newspaper records I found on, uh, when I was doing research on this case were not available on any online site. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, they were only available on microfilm at the Maryland State Archives. And they were, um, honestly, it was just a little small town farming community four page newspaper that three of the four pages every every issue were about crops you know how to grow better you know tobacco or you know whatever and and you know wasn't news in the sense that we think of a newspaper but that fourth page had community news mm. and and you know it made it easy to search because I could skip three out of every four pages um, you know, of course, you still had to do all of the searching um, manually. <laughs> you know, you, there was no search sure, engine on the microfilm. microfilm. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And I'm glad I, I still have a little bit of my microfilm arm here, my microfilm yeah. muscles, but they're, they're slowly falling away. And I've got a congratulations for you as well, of course, because I keep up with everybody. Um, just finished uh, as an instructor for a, at a week of GRIP, so that's a pretty incredible feat there, I think. Well, thank um, you. Hope that you enjoyed your week up there. Dear it Myrtle. Was. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank the Learning Channel for picking up Who Do You Think uh -huh. You Are? Um, I think NBC has just lost it, I mean, in their programming. And I know during the uh, commercial breaks we were cracking up because of the Honey Boo Boo commercials <laughs> and, and I tweeted something I really believe. I don't care about crazy commercials like that, but they're paying the bills. That's and right. so yeah. kudos to Lisa Kudrow and everybody at Who Do You Think You Are Live, or Who Do You Think You Are, um, because this I think they actually listened to the comments from previous years where we said, um, okay, why does it have to be a, a, a famous person? We understand that now. It's a draw. Mm -hmm. But what we also used to say was, it's like you're handing it to them on a silver platter. And what they're doing in these two episodes, which we watch back to back tonight, Mr. Mert and I, they're really making the journey more obvious that there's a great deal of time between finding the first document and then the second document and beginning to put these puzzle pieces together. So I think that, you know, we're, it's a lot more realistic. Like I mentioned at the top of the hour, this wasn't Hollywood perfect, all tied up in a pink little bow and all that. This was reality. And uh, so kudos to the production staff. And congratulations, Michael, on being able to do research. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I'd also, just to add to that, we can't forget to thank Ancestry.com as if they would let us. Um, <laughs> you know, but without Ancestry.com, this show probably would not exist either. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Definitely. Well, thank you once again, everybody. Um, my congratulations is threefold. So, um, dear Myrtle, congratulations on you finally getting your move settled and everything's <laughs> taken care of and getting into your new place, and that's exciting. So, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, yeah. So, thank you all very much once again for joining us uh, tonight, and hopefully, we'll we'll see you again soon on one of our hangouts after the show. This has been an incredible conversation, and I hope that a lot of people watch it because it's really been a learning experience. I think for everybody who's been on with us. That's it for the evening. Next week's episode of Who Do You Think You Are will be 8 o'clock Central Time, just like always on the TLC network. And you can catch all of the information from Gen Chat and Conference Keeper and In-Depth Genealogist on our social media channels. So check us out. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a great night.